Good evening and welcome to the second season of Louisiana Public Square. I'm Beth Courtney. Tonight we look at higher education in Louisiana. Whether it's parents complaining about costs or legislators concerned about fiscal control, the topic is always complex and compelling. For instance, we'd like to hear how you feel about tuition assistance for college students. Please take our quick poll online at lpb.org. Be sure to indicate where you live and we'll have the results at the end of the program. Well, the importance of high quality public colleges and universities cannot be overestimated. Communities need teachers, doctors, engineers, journalists, and lawyers. And our democratic form of government needs well-educated citizens to make informed decisions about important issues. But Louisiana gets D's for its performance in many education areas. The state is dead last out of 16 regional states in total public funding per full-time student. Louisiana is at the bottom of the class among its southern sister states in college graduation rates. And some educators claim that too much emphasis has been placed on enrollment in four-year universities versus two-year colleges. Academic preparation, funding priorities, and enrollment patterns are just three of many challenges facing higher education in Louisiana. Graduation, a time of happiness at the end of 16 years of classwork. As a measure of success, graduation rates are also the benchmarks of accomplishment among American colleges and universities. In Louisiana, however, most young people who go to public colleges never receive diplomas. Statewide, an average of only 32% of college students receive bachelor degrees in the six-year time period considered standard for measuring graduation rates. While some college officials argue many Louisiana students work while attending college, taking up to 10 years to graduate, others contend low achievement is a matter of weak preparation. Frankly, we're in trouble. Mark Music is president of the Southern Regional Education Board, which monitors higher education in the southeastern United States. Music says a majority of Louisiana students, especially African Americans and the poor, are not prepared to do college level work. We have uh, not done a good job in this country with persons who are from a lower income families. We've not done a good job you know, with persons who are from a racial ethnic minorities. And those are the fastest growing parts of the population in Louisiana and in other states in America. Although Louisiana colleges have operated under a civil rights consent decree for more than 30 years, higher education today is segregated by educational achievement. For instance, predominantly white LSU Baton Rouge has a 58% graduation rate, but at predominantly black Southern University at New Orleans, only 12% of students receive bachelor degrees in six years. Low achievement is a common thread among all state universities. At the University of Louisiana at Lafayette, for example, only 29% of students graduate. At the University of New Orleans, 24%. In North Louisiana, Louisiana Tech graduates about 51% of its students. But at the University of Louisiana at Monroe, only 29% receive diplomas. McNeese State in Lake Charles graduates 30% of its students, while Southern University in Baton Rouge has a 26% rate, and Northwestern in Natchitoches awards diplomas to about 30%. Private Tulane University leads all colleges in the state with a 74% graduation rate. The southern average among public colleges is 50 percent. The problem is, is that we're, we're uh, not even regionally prominent now, uh, much less nationally prominent. Jim Brandt is president of the Public Affairs Research Council. Brandt blames poor performance among Louisiana colleges on what he says is the outdated populist notion that everyone should go to college. In many cases now, we've got students that are going to four-year institutions that are unprepared for that, that experience, are dropping out, are not graduating. Uh, they should more appropriately start in a two-year community college uh, and then either work themselves into the workforce or into a four-year institution. That may be happening. In an effort to become nationally competitive, colleges such as LSU have adopted tougher entrance standards. As a result, thousands of students who no longer can get into LSU are turning to Louisiana's community colleges. Baton Rouge Community College, which is only six years old, is seeing student enrollment grow by double digits from year to year. Walter Bumpus is president of the state community and technical college system. It's projected that in the next 10 years, approximately 65 to 70 percent of the new jobs will require something more than a high school degree, but less than a baccalaureate degree. Based on the need for additional jobs that require 
associate degrees and certification, we believe that will position us very uniquely, very uniquely uh, in this marketplace. PAR's Jim Brandt points out Louisiana has invested billions in high-cost four-year institutions that have failed to produce nationally competitive student outcomes. We were very late uh, as, a, as a whole in getting into the um, community college system. We now only have uh, eight community colleges um, and only a, you know, about 25% uh, uh, of our students uh, in, in those uh, types of institutions, whereas on, on the whole, in the rest of the country, it averages about 50%. Educational experts have long agreed that Louisiana has too many four-year colleges for a state its size. Florida, for example, with a population four times larger than Louisiana, has 11. Louisiana has 14. Arizona, with a million more residents, has only three four-year schools. Looming larger is the fact Louisiana does not have a single public institution listed among U.S. News and World Report's top two tiers, which includes 130 research universities. The hope to change that rests with LSU, which is the state's only public research university and, by law, is Louisiana's official flagship institution. State education officials contend that making LSU nationally competitive will attract millions in federal grants, create high-wage jobs, and draw top students, faculty, and graduate students to Baton Rouge. The problem, LSU gets only 65 percent of the money university leaders claim they need to achieve national prominence in seven years. Mark Music says national prominence of a university is critical when corporate chiefs decide where to locate new industries. LSU can't be the best in everything, but LSU and Louisiana needs for LSU to be nationally recognized in several areas and for that name, Louisiana and LSU, to come up in these corporate discussions every, every month, every week across America. PAR President Jim Brandt concurs. Uh, if we don't compete, obviously that uh, translates into fewer jobs, uh, more people leaving the state, um, and uh, further uh, slide in, in the state's uh, economic fortune. PAR and education experts suggest restructuring Louisiana's enrollment mix to emphasize community colleges while developing a new master plan for higher education that better responds to state needs. Those changes would include setting mandatory admission standards for all colleges to ensure higher rates of student success, returning controls of tuition levels to Louisiana's four higher education management boards, and committing to making LSU nationally competitive by providing funding levels comparable to the country's leading public research universities. Again, SREB President Mark Music. Education. Uh, is the new uh, currency, if you will, or it is the currency of economic uh, success. And uh, a state just, uh, just can't be successful if it doesn't get a fair share of students to get a, either a certificate at a technical college or an associate degree or a bachelor's degree. It's just not going to work. As usual, our audience tonight was selected at random by LSU's Public Policy Research Lab. Residents of the Baton Rouge area were polled about their views on higher education in Louisiana. Here's some of what the survey revealed. The overwhelming majority of respondents, about 68 percent, feel that a college education is necessary to succeed in today's workforce, while half of participants believe both the state and the family should be responsible for students' tuition costs. Three out of four respondents say that if someone wants to attend college, they should be willing to work and go to school at the same time to pay for it. And if the state does provide tuition assistance, most agree that it should be based on financial need. Support is split almost equally on the question of providing tuition assistance to students attending private colleges. And finally, while almost 60 percent rated Louisiana's public colleges and universities as fairly equal to others in the southeast, the majority believe Louisiana's institutions could reduce their costs without hurting their quality. Well, does does this sound familiar to any of you? Yes, yeah. <laughs> it does indeed. Well, uh, that's a snapshot of what you were saying, but uh, you all, uh, great, quickly, let's go around. Tell us where you did some studying <coughs> at a higher post, at a graduate level. Mar John, where'd you go to school? I went to school at Texas A&M, and I have a bachelor's of, uh, bachelor of science in engineering and a master of engineering. 
Great. And Merle, you were you told me Southern? Is yes, that? yes, I am a graduate of Southern University. I have a BS degree in rehabilitation services and a master's degree in public administration. Now this is a randomly selected audience. I am impressed. <laughs> Dan, how about you? I have a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering from Georgia Tech, master's degrees in mechanical engineering and industrial engineering from Georgia Tech an MD from Mercer University School of Medicine, Good. and I did an emergency medicine residency here at LSU Medical Center. Well, I hope I don't need you. My voice is going to hand. <laughs> Kristen, how about you? I got a bachelor's from LSU in fashion merchandising, and I got a minor in business, and I went back and got a certificate in paralegal studies from LSU's continuing education. And, and Paul, you said when you went, anyone could go to LSU. Is that true? <laughs> no? Yes. Yes, it is. <laughs> But you went several times, right? Well, yes, it, the times changed. But anyway, 50 years ago, as I mentioned earlier, there wasn't any tuition at LSU. And all it took for a student to be accepted into LSU, if you were a graduate of an accredited state school, was to be in the top 90% of your class. Not too tough. <laughs> anyway, I finished uh, LSU some time ago, BS in geology, later BS in civil engineering, and later from the same school, an MS in civil engineering. And Thomas, you said you're studying all the time, right? That's right. I've been in school for the last 30 years because when I was coming up, it was pretty hard. I didn't have the opportunities that most of you all had, but I haven't given up. And math and science is your Math and science is where it's at. That's great. But higher education, without education, you might as well be dead, to be honest with you. Well, glad because you're here. if you right. can't manage or build the things uh, around you, why should you even waste your money? You understand? Because people go out there and they, they spend their hard-earned money to try to send their kids to school to do this, that, and other, and he's going to be out on the corner with some little bag in his hand with the police run behind him with him killing everybody else. So, you understand? When he should be in school. Yeah, but the thing about you, uh, you, you, the main thing I wanted to talk about is this money. We need money. Well, I've, you're going to get to ask a lot of specialists yeah, about Yeah, but I'm going to tell you right now, <laughs> okay, well, you need that money you can get that money. That money can come from those criminals, those that you, they can't give it back no other way, but they can give it out. There's a way they can give it back. You understand? It's I a do. way to pay back. It's a way back. Well, quickly, let me go around and see here wherever Catherine and you were. I started at LSU. I've got a bachelor's of general studies degree in urban planning from UNO, and I also have training in, in um, American Sign Language, which I currently use in the East Baton Rouge Parish School System. And Great. that's basically that. And Judy, you. You've attended all of them. I think I have them all in, in my <laughs> repertoire. I, actually, I graduated from Louisiana Tech in edu ed with an education degree and then got my master's in specialist at LSU. Um, so, And right now, I'm actually um, back in education, and I need certification for special education, so I'm online at Southern. Great. And enrolled my son at Southeastern. Well, so anyway, we're taking care of the schools. All right. And yes, sir, William. I have a BS degree in chemical engineering from Louisiana State University and uh, about 39 hours of graduate in chemical engineering. Terrific. And yeah, it's. I have a BS in biology from um, Alcorn State University. I have my MSN from Alcorn State University, and I just finished this spring with my MSN at Southern University. Well, wow, what, what, a, what a great group. And um, Kristen, though, you were telling us you had problems. You, well, you wanted to talk about an issue. You, you said, well, we're going to get right to it. What, what was your difficulty when you were in school? My difficulty was trying to get into the classes that I needed. My, my major was, it was not a big major, but it did cross over into other majors. But I couldn't get any of the classes that I needed. They were offered in the odd year, in the fall semester, and you had to have a, you know, 10 prerequisites for it and you couldn't get the prerequisites because they weren't offered except you know in the, the even year of the spring semester and so it was it's a mess you know I had, I had professors asking us you know why did you wait until your senior year to, to come and take this class you're supposed to be taking it your junior year and you have to tell the professor you know we couldn't get in do you think that's why some students perhaps drop out or they don't because you notice on our report we don't have a good completion rate do you 
Any speculations on that? Any of you all? Well, when I read that in the handout that you gave us, I, it made me a little curious because I had the same experience that he did 50 years ago when I was a freshman. And they sat us, the whole bunch of us, in a great big auditorium. I don't remember. It might have even been the Coliseum at LSU. There were that many of us. And the chap did the same thing to us as he did to him. He said, look to your left and look to your right. Two-thirds of you won't be here four years from now. But then what you, the sheet you handed to me said, that's, that rate is still about the same. A third don't finish. Well, when I started LSU in 1955, that was the first time the enrollment, student enrollment at LSU passed 10,000. Now I think there's 30,000 at least. Well, we certainly can get it directly from the chancellor when well, he's out here. We'll but ask at any him. rate, I guess, it, I don't know, I'm not too sure what point I'm trying <clears throat> to make is that the graduation rate is about the same, but the number of graduates has trebled. Mm -hmm. Well, that must mean something. Well, I think that's a good question to ask, perhaps, our experts. But uh, what about cost? What about cost of college? I'd like to address uh, Kristen. Oh, sure. Uh, Kristen. A, a little bit in more detail. Sure. Um, I remember some of the same problems that you encountered in reference to classes not being available or being offered at different semesters, being that I have graduated from a university with two degrees. Now I realize that a part of the problem is advising. So, and as adults, then we have to be more accountable and more responsible for being aware of our schedules and being aware of when classes are offered at the beginning of the entry level at a university. So perhaps what you encountered and what I've encountered will help freshmen, incoming freshmen that are enrolling in, in uh, the university. Also, sometimes when you go in as a freshman, you don't know exactly what your major is going to be. Right. You know, you, you may change your major, and when you change your major, mm -hmm. if the program has changed since you enrolled in school, the qualifications are totally different. So you also have that problem of trying to keep up with the program and try to make sure that what you already have can flow over. And I think that that's also another problem. A lot of the colleges, you know, if you need to transfer from one college, they don't accept credit from other colleges. Mm. So you end up repeating classes that you've already taken, spending more money, mm -hmm. you know, and you feel like you're wasting your time. So why would you want to keep trying to go through and finish your education when you feel like you're repeating everything that you've already done? And, and nursing, you're not getting any further. In nursing, we are experiencing a different problem, pretty much the same issue, but a different problem. There's not enough nursing faculty. Oftentimes, you'll hear that um, we need more um, students, we need more nurses. There's a nursing shortage. There's no faculty. And you run into that problem that if a nurse has problems in a personal life and she has to repeat a class, she's got to wait till that cycle comes around. And therefore, I don't think it's always the same issue with every one student attrition. Dr. Marsha Wells at Southern University in the nursing department, her doctorate work was on student attrition. Those nurses then might try to go to the lake and see if they can speed it up a little bit. They'll drop out from there and see they, they run into that roadblock. They'll run to Baton Rouge General. They run into that roadblock. That's the reason why they're staying in school so long and then after a while they just said, forget it, I'm, I'm, I'm through. It's, it's the frustration from what you're saying, mm. but well, it seems it's to me a common like that, problem. That, uh, that there's not enough preparation for the transition from the high school to college. No. And it seems to me like that, that that falls right on the back of the, this university on how they train the teachers. I, I, I have serious objection to the university complaining about the quality of high school students when at the same time they produce the, the people, the, train the people who do the teaching to produce these students that they claim are not qualified. You see LSU's research university, but you never see anything constructive coming out of the education department at Louisiana State University to help improve education in Louisiana. But yet the university is always complaining about the quality of the students. Well, well good and, question. Yes, and actually you? at our school, I teach, I'm actually a teacher at Highland Elementary, and we do have a partnership with LSU, and we have seen some excellent, um, you know, cooperation from LSU, mm -hmm. and we do some, some research studies with our students there. I think that, you know, my question to be, would, would be to the, the chancellors, do they ever do exit interviews at any point with these students, like mm -hmm. you would in corporate America, to find out at what point we've already listed three issues that could be barriers for completion. What other uh, issues, or do they even 
uh, want to get this that? information. Yeah. Catherine, you've been wanting <coughs> to say something. Um, part of the, <coughs> as Ms. Judy was saying, a lot of the students currently in public school system, elementary and middle schools, just simply don't have the discipline or the inclination to make themselves well-educated, learned people. They just won't stick to any one thing. And everybody nowadays thinks education has to be fun and all this kind of stuff. You know, you just have to sit yourself down and learn these things. And most of the kids these days just simply won't do that. And that's a well something you, they're missing out on. So. I, I brought up cost earlier. Mm -hmm. Did anybody want to talk about that? Because you all seem to think that we were less expensive here in Louisiana, and that's probably true. Mm -hmm. But uh, what, what about TOPS? Are you all familiar with TOPS? That's a great mm -hmm. tuition program. So you can, what, what's your reaction to TOPS, John? I think it's a very progressive, I was quite surprised. I'm, I'm not originally from Louisiana when I first looked into that. I thought that was a very progressive step by Louisiana because it's merit-based. Exactly. It wasn't necessarily need-based. And uh, of course, need-based scholarships are out there and available for students who need them. But merit-based basically t it communicates to all the students that if you put yourself the hard work and discipline, you're, you're going to have an opportunity to have some of your funding paid for by the state. Your background addressed that point sort of obtusely when one of, obtusely. The, one of the last sentences in the <laughs> right. background or commented that the need-based scholarships um, tend not to be applied for for two primary reasons. The students don't think they qualify for need-based scholarships or they miss right. deadlines. And that's not so much an issue of lack of initiative, it's a, an issue of lack of information. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I just filled out the TOPS form online. And, you know, I think of myself as fairly educated and intelligent. And I think a lot of the forms are very intimidating. And if that is a barrier, then that could be remedied. I don't see that that would be a problem for us to take advantage of those uh, scholarships that are out there. I think TOPS is an excellent, excellent, um, you know, initiative in place in Louisiana. And um, my concern is I, I have some students that I teach that don't, that wouldn't quite make the mark. And I'm concerned that they don't have an opportunity because usually the scholarships or the grants are tied to grade point average as well. Well, um, so you think, so you're totally against having it be needs based. I mean, I'm, I'm hearing you all say, so a millionaire ought to get a TOPS. Sure, Doesn't matter. Sure. All right, I'm just. I think, I think it should be a combination of both. I think you have to look at, at both parts. You know, you. In Florida, I know that they don't just look at, they have a program similar. <coughs> I have a niece that goes to school there, and they look at grade point average. They also look at ACT, SAT scores. So if you, you know, may have slipped in your grade point average, your SAT, ACT can compensate a bit, and the reverse is the same. And that gives you a certain percentage of financial aid to go to, you know, a, a, a higher education. But, you know, I think you have to look at both of them because you've got some you've got some kids that are you know just so financially downtrodden that they can't afford college no matter how hard they work themselves we, to do it. We you heard, know you uh, have to look at that. We heard Walter Bumpus, the head of the community college system, say that the jobs for the future some of them really only require associate degrees as opposed to a four year. Is that your experience too? What what y'all's experience? No, that is not my experience. I, I wonder what um, I work for the state of Louisiana. And it's very bad when you have educated yourself, you have a master's degree, you have a PhD degree, and you're working for someone with a high school degree. Their level of functioning, their cognitive understanding of the job, this learn while you earn, that's not good. That's staggering the state of Louisiana. If we're ever going to progress, you're talking about a research-based state. Junior colleges do not teach research. I really looked up that question. I, I said, how am I going to say this? But they don't do research. They don't know what outcomes your means justifying your end. They need to understand the basic principle. Is this a sound study? If you're going to bring some study they did in Missouri, it worked real fine. Do they understand the population that they chose to look at? It's mm -hmm. a lot involved with research. It almost stopped me from getting my master's. <laughs> you know, it's a lot with research. You have to understand the design of a study in order to implement it in another state. You could spend more money than, you, than you're saving with this mm -hmm. new technology. So no, mm -hmm. I don't agree with that. Well, um, so we've had an exit interview. That's an interesting question. Any other kind of things like that you want to 
craft to ask some of our chancellors that we're going to have here and presidents. Another question I'd like to ask. Sure. Who's in charge? The children are the, are the teachers, are the instructors, because the kids, they don't seem like they have to understand. They don't understand. They don't have to listen. They don't have to do anything. And if you touch me, I'll put you in jail. I'll dial 911 on you. Well, that's, <laughs> I'm not sure who has the answer for that one. <laughs> but that's I'm it. in charge in my classroom. <laughs> I'll tell you that. <laughs> well, that, well that, is a, that is a modern day problem. I'm sure discipline, certainly at the K-12 level, is terrifically, absolutely. Dan. One of the things oh, that concerns wait, me is when you read about the university, they talk about the admissions, tuition, uh, the completion rates, uh, all of these topics about students. But yet, they want to call it, they want to make it a research university. Now, I'd like to know just exactly what do they want to, want students for if they want a research university, and why? Uh, you know, it's 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 obvious that if you restrict your admission to those who make the highest grades, that you're going to have a higher the completion rate. That's not anything you need to be proud of. You just don't let people in that, you know, may <laughs> not make it. Uh, I don't think that's some <coughs> takes any genius. And uh, I, I just really feel like that the, the public expects LSU to to be a university that teaches students, put produces good graduates that can go out in society and and apply those principles that they've been taught and improve society. And uh, I, I just don't understand why we can't have the emphasis on the students and then some research rather than research. And uh, mm -hmm. I personally. That's one of my favorite subjects. Right. Yeah, I I'd like to, I'd oh, like to agree okay. with William, honestly. It, Georgia Tech, my alma mater, uh, was a college that for almost 100 years placed its primary emphasis on undergraduate engineering education and was not a research center for until well into the 70s. Once it established its fact as a premier undergraduate engineering institution to put bachelor's level engineers into the job system, then it went into the research field and it was already established upon a base of good fundamental engineering and could then very quickly spring into research. I really do, I want to say that I agree with William. The, the primary focus of a four-year college institution should be its undergraduate program. And you agree, evidently, Paul. That's sure. your, yeah. I was spent nine years working for the highway department or Department of Transportation at the Louisiana Transportation Research Center, which is at LSU. And of course, we dealt with a lot of the professors. I was somewhat disappointed at a lot of the professors' motivation, which was, well, let me back up a step. A full-time professor teaches 12 hours a week. That's a full load for him. But he can, I'm, I'm assuming that's still well, correct. Well, we'll find out. <laughs> yes. But at any rate, he can reduce that load, which all of them tried to do by doing research. And, I don't, and eventually, if he gets enough little students to make clones out of, <laughs> I hate to put it that way, but I will, um, he doesn't have to teach at all. So now here we are. It, it sounds like a, conflict of, a conflicting interest. We have the man, woman, who knows all there is to know, supposedly, about whatever it is they're there for, but they don't teach anymore. I think, I think that's got a very good point. I'd like to amen another person on the panel here. Okay. It really, um, I could speak to the, uh, to the field of science and technology in that the, the foundation knowledge of what makes science and technology what it is was figured out hundreds of years ago. Your undergraduates are not that interested in what the cutting edge technology is, but they want to know how can I understand what Isaac Newton figured out 400 years ago. It hasn't changed in 400 years. The key issue is how do you teach it to someone, not what can we figure out tomorrow that's new. The undergraduates don't need to know that. Well, Dan, on that note, we're going to pause a moment, and when we return, we'll be joined by a panel of experts to further discuss higher education in Louisiana. We'll be back in a moment. You don't just watch the news, you understand it. You get the full story and the issues behind it. You know the causes, the relevance, the lasting impact. You get honest, intelligent answers to hard questions. You get coverage you can trust. 
objective, in-depth reporting by award-winning journalists. You get the stories that no one else is telling. Stories that matter, that challenge you, provoke you, empower you. You get it all from the most honored network in television journalism, PBS. You're invited to Louisiana Public Square, right in the center of our state's political landscape. It's where everyday citizens gather to share opinions, feelings, and most importantly, questions about the things that really matter in our lives. Economic development, education, health care, taxes, all the issues that thinking citizens just like you want to know more about. Join us in a conversation where everything's on the table and on the square, Louisiana Public Square. Next month's program, an encore presentation of religion and government. Who do you trust to tell all sides of a story? Who do you trust to let different voices be heard? Who do you trust to teach your children? Who do you trust to help make sense of it all? Americans trust PBS more than any other television network. Discussing higher education tonight on Public Square. Joining us now is our panel of experts, Dr. Joseph Savoy, Commissioner of Higher Education, Dr. Sally Clawson, head of the University of Louisiana Systems, Dr. Edward Jackson, Chancellor of Southern University in Baton Rouge and Interim President of the Southern University System, and Sean O'Keefe, Chancellor of Louisiana State University in Baton Rouge. Thank you all for being with us tonight. We appreciate it so much. We have a great group of participants, and we're gonna go directly to them because they have some good questions for you all. Who wants to start? Dan, I know you do. No. <laughs> well, I don't know if I have a question, but if I could be so bold, it might be a suggestion that was brought up by the ladies I'm sitting next to. Uh, in their difficulties in getting required classes that were only offered on fairly unusual and what it sounds like almost capricious schedules, um, again, the undergraduate institution I went to had a, as a policy and matter of form, every required class was offered every term. So your non-traditional students or students who happen to fall behind or co-op students who went and worked for certain periods of time never had a problem with trying to adjust a schedule even from the beginnings of their days in college. So I don't know what resources are required to do that, but it might be a thought in that it already works well for one fairly good institution in a different state. Any reaction to that? We were hearing problems with scheduling and just frustration and then having to, maybe that's one of the reasons we, why we have some low completion rates. Anybody? Well, I did hear the magic word, which is advisement. Uh, that's a very critical factor and one that we're all constantly challenging to try and improve. The fact of the matter is that we probably don't have the resources to have the, the kind of abundance that you're talking about, having all required courses offered every semester. That would be a dream situation. We would love to have that. But the fact of the matter is that we're not able to do that. And so what we do do is lay out a four-year schedule and so that a youngster coming in or a student coming in should be able to determine whenever a course is going to be offered. He, knows, he or she knows from the first year what sequence of courses will be offered in any given semester. And you must have good faculty advisement in order to do it. You cannot do it alone. And the, the mistake that we find most students make is that they try and do it alone. I just echo that. And there was a great comment, I think, Kristen, you observed in there, too, is earlier in the, in the program, is the students don't know what they want to do when they first get there. So as a consequence, the range of choice is something we seek to offer in, certainly at LSU and I think at every institution. But the process of developing that choice and making it that flexible, I think, is exactly mm -hmm. as uh, President Jackson just has alluded to, it, it takes a lot of effort, a lot of resource, 
and there's a lot of flexibility required on the part of students too. I so totally I think you made a good point. That, but I'm talking about, I was in the middle of my major. You know, I was in those core classes that I needed for my major. There was no alternative. There was no alternative offered. You know, I had no choice but try to fill my schedule with things that, that I really didn't need. You know, and, and trying to get the classes that I did need, you know, if a finance class finally came up that I could get into, it conflicted with something that was offered in the fall semester of an odd year that I had to take. So it was choose one or choose the other. You're not going to be able to do both. There's, there's no way. So what I'm saying is you, I think it needs to be a little bit easier because let me tell you, I was pulling my hair out trying to figure out when I could get out of school, you know, and just be done. And, you know, I had talked to my advisors and all they can tell me is, well, it's not offered until, you know, here you have no choice but to wait. There's no alternative. There's nothing to, to compensate for that class. You know, find something else to take, you know, get a minor, something like that. But, you know, I felt, I felt as if I was wasting my time and money. To be, to be honest, I mean, I really did. Well, your point's still well taken. What, We've got know. to improve the range of options. Yeah. What about articulation agreements between schools? Because some of you were, t you were talking about nurses going from one school to another school to another school. Have we worked out all those articulation agreements between transferring credits? or? Well, we've made significant progress. I think uh, generally now in the state, for most of the general education courses, about the first uh, 60 hours or so, that those will transfer among all the institutions. Uh, that effort began with the development of the community college system where it became necessary to make sure the students who started off the community college could transfer easily to the four-year schools. So we've made, I uh, think, pretty significant progress. We've also done it with, uh, within certain degree programs in business, for example, this articulation all the way through. So the courses will transfer among institutions all the way through the four-year degree. Well, it's not perfect, but it's, it's significantly better than it was. Well, John, you were a big defender. Of, you thought TOPS was great. It was innovative. Now, I, I know something about these folks. We, what we didn't get into is TOPS may be good from one side, but on the other hand, it doesn't seem to put any more money into the, <laughs> into the school's pocket. It is rather than coming, it comes out of the state general fund, rather than coming from a parent's pocket, but it doesn't mean, mean any more necessarily to the schools. Mm -hmm. is it, do you all have a problem with TOPS? Or give, give me your reactions to that. Well, I'll start. I think TOPS has been uh, a significant benefit to the state in many ways. More students are taking the uh, appropriate courses in high school to prepare themselves well. Uh, we have larger numbers of students who are high school graduates going on to college. Because they're prepared better, they're succeeding at higher rates. Graduation rates are improving. ACT scores are improving. So there's significant advantage uh, uh, to TOPS for that particular segment. The, the benefit of TOPS accrues to the, stu to the student and their family. It's uh, not something that the universities receive any benefit from directly, except that we're getting more better prepared students. Uh, there are about 40,000 students who are receiving TOPS, but we have another 170,000 or so students, many of them adults, who are not. And so we're constantly looking at ways to support working adults, uh, students who might be right at the edge, who don't quite make the uh, uh, TOPS uh, uh, cutoff. And, we need to invest more in uh, supporting uh, students from a need-based uh, approach as well. Other questions? Yeah. I had a question. Um, at the break, they discussed that the legislation was meeting to discuss whether or not to, to allow the universities to uh, manage uh, tuition increases in high school. Mm -hmm. why, why would this be important? Why would it be helpful to the students and to the state that the universities have this ability to, do, to, to manage their so? Two Thank things. Um, this, the students have a closer tie to the management boards. They can come anytime. Uh, the legislature's in session probably once a year, sometimes twice in special session. But students are not shy. They're smart. They're savvy today. Uh, they can come to us closely, uh, have a close conversation with us, and talk about their needs and uh, their concerns and they can also make sure that we stay centered on them. The student, I heard you talk about students earlier, that the students are the ones that we stay focused on and, we, and that's our job. We're constitutionally mandated to manage the systems, so therefore our primary focus is what the students need uh, happens to be at that point in time and how we can adjust our own schedules, our advising, our cost, uh, our priorities to ensure that uh, they're being managed appropriately with the student first. Well, let me just maybe add to that. Uh, universities have two primary sources of revenue. One is state appropriation, the other is tuition. Uh, 
we have to be able to have an adequate amount of money in order to provide quality services. And so there needs to be an appropriate balance between the two. Louisiana is one of only three states that requires legislative approval in order to increase tuition. We're the only state that requires two-thirds vote of the legislature. Same thing you need to, to change the Constitution to increase tuition fees by five dollars, uh, if that's the number. Uh, it puts us in the position of a very political uh, uh, game every year in arena uh, to try to make basic management decisions which affect our ability to provide classes when students need them which uh, affect our ability to provide uh, faculty pay raises and all those other things we think it over politicizes what is basically a management process the boards would be in the same public scrutiny from students and others to make sure they don't get out of hand the legislature could always uh, restrict that if it does get out of hand but we think it over politicizes what should be a management process yes thank you Question for Dr. Jackson. Mm -hmm. um, Dr. Jackson, I just finished in your master's program of nursing, mm -hmm. and right now we have a bill before the legislature, and I think the legislature just need to deal more with these laws and let the school people do what they do, <laughs> manage the schools. But anyway, they're looking at a bill now for schools. They want to take some of the fattening foods out of schools. Your program has a lot of interesting research going on in the nursing department mm -hmm. with health healthcare disparities among African Americans. Mm -hmm. And it shocked me because the way I got to your school, I was in the Department of Mental Health Counseling and one of your instructors, Dr. Betty Fromby, mm -hmm. she came over and did a speech. Immediately, the next day, I was over in your school of nursing, Dr. Constant Hendricks signed me up mm -hmm. and I had to go back and tell Dr. Albert I'm leaving you. I'm going back home to the other nurses. There's so much interesting research that they're doing over there, but the public is not aware of it. Um, you're looking at heart disease, and you're saying uh, you, you're moving toward a research status because that's all you're hiring now. And I'm so sorry because I can't come there and teach now, but um, <laughs> you're moving toward a research status. Why don't you tell the public about what's going on? Because they could really help those guys in session make know. a decision. We, we try very hard. Uh, in, in fact, I have uh, a little thing that I do with the media once a month. I hold a, a chancellor's a media breakfast, and we invite all of the media to come to campus, and we profile uh, programs. Nursing is often one of those. You, you're absolutely right. It's a, it's a tremendous area, and it's filling a very significant void in this state. Not only are we producing nurses, minority nurses, male nurses, uh, Caucasian nurses, we're producing them all, but we're also producing teachers who can go out and teach nursing and create yet more nurses. And so we're doing all of that. We have a mobile unit, we have a mobile treatment you unit, and we're on. all over the state with it. We, we work through our Ag Center. We cooperate with the LSU Extension Service and work through theirs. And so we do a lot of things to, to try and profile that area. But you're absolutely right. It's a tremendous you have area. credit that you deserve for yeah. some of the things. I was really shocked. I was, I've been here 20 years in the state of Louisiana. I had no idea you had that much stuff going on. I always see things from LSU, what they're doing, mm -hmm. stuff coming to my house. And I, I've been taking advantage of that. I've gone through the continuing education. But some of the things that are at my heart, my passion, mm -hmm. you know, dealing with diabetes, dealing with heart disease mm -hmm. with African Americans, mm -hmm. I'd love to get involved in that. And the public just do not know about it. Mm -hmm. and, and, and you need to get more PR where that's concerned. Well, I think isn't, the, isn't that the challenge that we've been hearing about universities reaching out into the communities and communities knowing what resources <coughs> are there. And that's been one of the challenges. Certainly, that's you talked about. Chancellor O'Keefe, when you came in, that's one of your outreach problems. Absolutely. No, it's, it's, it's imperative that we get out regularly and talk to each of the communities and spend time with editorial boards and certainly the legislators because they uh, certainly have an opportunity to, to reflect on this. But it, it, it's, a, it's a real challenge putting that in context. And certainly the progress being from uh, the state originally and now coming back after some time, uh, I find the progress here in education to be remarkable, absolutely stunning. And it's just an opportunity to have, have reflected on it by looking from a distance that uh, there's a, a very different attitude in the state and it's a very strong commitment towards education today that is on the move and it's on the on the, a progressive kind of scale. That didn't exist 10 years ago. It's a very, very different place today. 
I, I would agree with you. I taught school 30 years ago, and then I'm back in the classroom now after taking a, a business stint, um, and, and, and I'm loving it, and I'm seeing where kids have learned more. My question to you would be, as, as um, Jim Brandt stated, that lobby, and, and certainly we all know, economic development is tied so closely to education. Um, just as you said and as we've seen, with our K to 12 students, they're doing better, as we've seen in the state testing results. But what are the universities going to do to overcome that the image um, that we have in regard to where we fit in with the other southern states as, as lacking in completion rates and lacking, we're just now starting the community college system, um, and what other barriers that we may have where we're um, still behind the other southern states. What are we doing so that we could look better to attract business to our state? I can uh, volunteer <laughs> that. We have, we have just, and you'll be appreciative of this being in the classroom yourself, we've just totally redesigned the way we prepare teachers for the next century for the knowledge economy. What, what I needed to learn and know when I was in third and sixth grade is nothing compared to what students today have to. Plus, teachers like yourself have to infuse technology. You have to teach students to diverse backgrounds. You have to know how to infuse all sorts of new information. You have to know more, and students have to know more. We've totally redesigned those programs. That requires us to not only redesign those programs for the students that we used to accept, but now we know that we have to be preparing all students all students for college today and that requires a, a highly qualified certified teacher in every classroom preparing for college begins in preschool and that pipeline sometimes gets lost if we don't give every student the equal opportunities so we have some poor minority students maybe about a hundred thousand of them in Louisiana today that do not have a qualified certified teacher one of the emphasis that we have had, all of us here at this table, is to change that so that every student has an opportunity to go to, to school. Our, our economy will require it for the future and that every student will have an opportunity to afford that college. So it, it has been an emphasis for us. Um, we're not there yet, but I think you'd be proud of the kinds of work that we're doing in nursing and teaching. I have 84,000 students every one of those students have to look for a class and they are waiting to have that class at the time that they simply want it. They have to have the right advisors. Uh, I have to be out, my presidents have to be out raising money, communicating with the media like you. They have to know how to advise their faculty. They have to come to the management boards and justify their budgets and I have to then in turn justify it to people like you. It's exhausting. <laughs> yeah. one, major, one major shift of this, though, I think, is that you know, Commissioner Savoy has really led a, a lot here in the last uh, decade in really stratifying the choices and the opportunities in order to specialize, provide the kind of opportunities at selection, rather than, I think what Paul described very aptly, which was a one-size-fits-all approach to higher education that existed in the state. Mm -hmm. That's not here anymore. In a lot of ways, what has really occurred is, a, is an opportunity to differentiate we're not there yet. Kristen's point's right on. You still have to have choice. You still have to have the opportunity to choose. But the flexibility today and the stratification of those choices, the range of options you have, is much wider today than it was just a decade ago. Mm -hmm. And that's a very, very distinguishing feature of what higher, higher education in Louisiana looks like today. So, uh, Thomas, yes. you want a quick question? Yes. Yes. Uh, Mr. Paul and uh, Mr. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Whatever his name. I am. Well, his name. Okay. Well, it wasn't for people like you all. I couldn't be here today. I wouldn't want to be here today. I've been paralyzed 30 years. And you all have helped me so much and gave me the boost to want to go be something besides nothing. I come from nothing to something, and it's because of you all. And I worry about the children that's coming behind you all, you understand, being protected, you understand, that we'll have a strong America, you understand, as strong as they all have been. 
because they brought me from the grave six times and and stand and put me in school for 30 years you understand and they they got me on a whole path of, of, of a new a way of life and a way of living and desire I mean it's just it's just so it's so tremendous I mean I just love the way that um, I see when I came here to Louisiana it was nothing but woods and bushes and trees <laughs> and I'm looking at a city that I only can imagine uh, in some type of storybook but it's Amer uh, Louisiana you are wonderful <laughs> well, Thomas, you've inspired us for education. We, we're, we, we only have a few more. I want everybody else to get a chance. Catherine, you want to ask something? I want everybody to get a chance. No, ma'am. Okay, how about you, William? You wanted to ask Dr. Clawson something, right? Well, yes. I, 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 I'm extremely impressed with your guarantee when you were at Southeastern. Thank you, sir. And uh, listening to you talk then, I, I feel like you have a real tremendous interest in the students' success all the students. Yes, sir. Uh, I, I was wondering about the universities, their emphasis on the students. When we read in the paper, we read about excluding students, uh, increase in ACT score, uh, the completion rates. It's, everything is the students' problem. I was wondering what the universities are doing to, to help improve the education of the students coming from the school system. What do you, I, I don't see uh, recommendations from the education department at LSU on improving the education. We just complain about it. And uh, <laughs> it seems to me like that LSU should be a source of improvement. Yes, sir, and we certainly aspire to be, and, and obviously have to do a much better job. I think your, your point is, is right on. We're obviously not getting that message out because clearly the, the, uh, the education college has, uh, um, had been a leader, I think, throughout the state. It's a wide range of, of folks throughout the state, and certainly the the, uh, the dominant uh, school from which many of the uh, K through 12 teachers that come from has been LSU. We really have to emphasize that point. You're exactly right on. We've really got to get that uh, that message out there a whole lot better. But to the central point that you've raised, I think earlier, I really like to what I've seen at LSU in my short four months there is this is a student-centered research institution. And the student center part of it, part of it is really very much to, to help encourage the opportunity, very much different than what Paul described, I think, as an attitude that existed in which the burden of proof was on the student to demonstrate why you had the right to stay, is now one in which the requirement we have that we're trying to, I think, infuse the cultural matter to all of our faculty, is we have an obligation to assure that every student who has an opportunity is there to stay and complete and do so to the best of their ability. And as a consequence, that completion rate is much, much higher. Mm -hmm. Freshman and sophomore um, uh, retention rate is now at 85 percent. It's a whole different approach of the expectation of faculty is if you've come in the door and you're qualified to be there, our obligation is to make sure you have every opportunity to excel and to realize your greatest potential. And that's something we've really got to drive home as a a broader cultural matter, I think, uh, and get that word communicated much more broadly because that's a big shift in mindset that I remember just a few decades ago. Well, one thing, college should not be an intimidating word. No kid in Chicago, no kid in the world should not be able to go to college because some of your brightest politician, uh, famous people, they were not A students, they were not B students, and some of them really were not C students in high school. So those grades do not. I wasn't going to I wasn't going to talk about my personal background, but you know, well, it should be achievable. Point. It should be achievable. Well, well Paul, we're going to let you have the last question here. Okay, I was going to uh, ask uh, uh, Mr. O'Keefe if there was something he could do on the same line he was talking about making it a student-centered research organization, which sounds wonderful. Can you do away with publish or perish? Well, it's it's a it's a faculty uh, uh, tradition I think that exists nationally. And it's something that's been part of I think the uh, the academic community for a good long time. Is there be requirements for uh, faculty performance, and that's really what that is. Publish or perish I think is is more of a uh, 
um, a, a shorthand for what our performance criteria. If anything, we're trying to expand that performance criteria to include requirements for a broader range of public service opportunities, more teaching responsibility. We recognize exemplars who are teachers uh, of, of great standing, as well as those who are of tremendous research potential. And in a research potential, that's an opportunity to give experiential learning to the same students as well. And so the student center aspect of this ought to be the, the primary focus, and everything else ought to be supportive of that. And I think that's an attitude that's, that's infusing its way that I see in my short time at LSU that is dominant in the culture there and is growing, I think, in, in uh, the span of time to really emphasize that dimension. Well, our yeah, short time success. together Thank is you. going to have to end. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. we're, we've had such a great group and a well-educated group, I might add, here tonight, mm -hmm. randomly selected. Mm -hmm. We thank Dr. Savoy, Dr. Clausen, Jackson, O'Keefe for being with us. Uh, it has been a pleasure. We'll be back in just a moment, but right now we're going to take a short break. We hope you joined us for our online survey. We'll, we've had a great conversation here, and uh, we're going to begin continuing it here in the studio. But you can go online and take the quiz. Uh, that's our show for this week. Uh, next month, we will be back with a repeat program, a look at religion and government. It's a rebroadcast of one of the most fascinating programs in our premier season of Public Square. For all of us here at Louisiana Public Broadcasting, good night. A home video of this program is available. For more information, call 1-800-973-7246 or write to the address on your screen.